As we know now how to deal with an indeterminate situation and that left atrial strain really can help us, we have to discuss the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction a bit more. But what does that exactly mean, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and which therapy can we even use in this growing, growing patient population? In this slide, you can appreciate a diagnostic algorithm from the ESC guidelines of 2021 of heart failure for the diagnostic of heart failure. And if we go down this algorithm, we see that echocardiography plays an important role. And if you find abnormal findings, you can distinguish which phenotype of heart failure is present by means of left ventricular ejection fraction. And we have three phenotypes. The First phenotype is the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. That's everything below or 40%. We have the heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. That's 41 to 49%. And the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is above or 50%. In echocardiography and ejection fraction, we talk a little bit in different means of grading ejection fraction. So first of all, there is a severely reduced ejection fraction, which would be below 30%, a moderately reduced ejection fraction, which still would fall under the definition of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It is 30 to 39%, the mildly reduced ejection fraction, which is 40 to 49%, which would probably equal the mildly reduced ejection fraction. And we have a normal ejection fraction, so above or 50%. Now we know that the therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction has new treatment options. Not too long ago, the ARNIS were introduced, the neprilysine inhibitor combined with an angiotensin receptor blocker. And we have those pillars of optimal medical heart failure treatment, the beta blockers, the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, the ARNIs, and you have to give the maximal possible dose to your patient. But there's one more class of heart failure therapy. It's making our hearts or the hearts of our patients even happier. It's this specific substance. You can see it over here. Probably you all know it's the so-called SGLT2 inhibitor. So those are the four pillars of optimal therapy in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And you see that the RNAs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, they are relatively new. Now, what about diastolic dysfunction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Well, very long, we didn't know what to give those patients. We could have given the mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, which did help, but we were not sure in regards of the data if it really was an optimal treatment. But there were some new developments in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And why is this so important? Why do we need treatment for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Because our population is aging. Because we are aging, our hearts become small and stiff. Think about hypertensive heart disease, diabetes, also about several cardiomyopathies where heart failure also with preserved ejection fraction plays an important role and diastolic function as well. In patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, their hospitalizations, their mortality, the one-year mortality, and even the five-year mortality, they are very high. And basically, the only thing we could do was diuretic therapy for symptom control, so against the dyspnea. So the prognosis overall was bad. Then there was this the Emperor Preserved study from 2021, which introduced the SGLT2 blockers to the treatment of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Let us summarize what these SGLT2 inhibitors actually do. They work at the proximal tubule of the kidney. We have the natrium and glucose co-transporters, so it causes glucosuria if we block this SGLT2. Overall, the SGLT2 blockers were introduced as a therapy for diabetes and they reduce the blood glucose levels. They work independent of insulin. Now they also have standing in diabetes mellitus type 1, so not only type 2. They rarely cause hypoglycemia because of the still existing SGLT1. So if there's an SGLT2 transporter, there has to be an SGLT1 transporter. It also lowers the blood pressure, but this is a minor effect of the SGLT2 blockers. But what is very important and has to be noted is they are really great in protecting the kidney. So it's a nephroprotective substance and it's also a cardioprotective substance. There are some side effects. You need to tell your patients that they notice that the genital infections, the urinary tract infections and hypotension. 
A severe side effect could be ketoacidosis, so in patients with the reduced renal functions, be aware of this complication. 